This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. It's finally here. The Detroit Lions tonight are going to play in front of the entire nation. And here today on Doc and Jock, you're going to hear the breakdown between the Detroit Lions and the Kansas City Chiefs. What's going to happen? All the rumors, news, craziness that's going to happen when the NFL schedule kicks off. Man, what an opportunity that we got. It's going to be fun because it's now time. It's put up or shut up time. Crazy news happening this week with the Lions and their roster, the Chiefs and what's going on with their great tight end. It's a big game for the Detroit Lions, make or break. Lots of stuff to get into, but man, how good does it feel? Everybody in the entire nation tonight is going to watch on NBC the Detroit Lions face off for three hours from 820 to hopefully 1130, a great contest in which they'll face off against the defending Super Bowl champions, and boy, it's it's come a long way for the Detroit Lions, and now they're in front of a nationally televised audience. I just can't wait to see how it shakes out and how the Lions stack up against arguably the best team in the league. Yeah, I mean, this is big time, right? The I think the concern, the, the fear that I think is in the back of everybody's mind, at least I know it's in mine, is I, look, I told you before, and we're going to get into it a little bit later, but I think this team wins this game, but... I have a small little nugget, little granular of doubt in my back of my head that is fearful that this team might fall flat on its face. And I think that's the one thing that all of us Lions fans don't want to happen, don't want to see. And going in this week, there's already been a little bit of drama with the Lions and the roster. We're going to talk about that. You've got guys who are possibly like like Pro Bowl players, a Pro Bowl tight end, and a Pro Bowl defensive tackle that are probably going to miss this game, which bode well for the Lions. But again, there's news, there's noise, all this coming out of Allen Park. You were kind of in the middle of it, and it all kind of surrounded Isaiah Bugs. It was the big thing that broke on Monday. I was on a boat in the middle of Lake St. Clair, and I'm checking my phone. I'm like, what the heck's going on with Isaiah Bugs? And I'm going to Twitter, reading through everything, trying to piece stuff together. And, and like I said, you were, you were feet on the ground. You were in the mix. What the hell's going on? What, what is up with Isaiah Bugs? Is this just a, 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 a guy who is acting like a baby? Or does he have a right to be a little bit upset with being benched? It's crazy, right? Part of me thought, wait a minute, this is so outside the box for the Lions locker room. Is this Dan Campbell playing games with the Chiefs, I mean, it's crazy, but he was asked about it. Isaiah Bugs doing stuff on social media. It's a little bit weird for the Lions, but I look at it and I say, at the very least, it's reasonable to expect that a player is going to be upset when he gets told that he's not going to play at all. And you look at it, it's not that much of a stretch to realize that James Houston, Benito Jones, John Kaminsky, Broderick Martin have the opportunity maybe to play a little bit more than Isaiah Bugs. I just think that the question mark is, why would the Lions decide to just bench him instead of just making him, you know, uh, available but playing him five snaps? I mean, if you want as many defensive linemen as possible, but Dan Campbell was asked on Tuesday and he said it's all about the tape because Isaiah Bugs said that he thinks that it's more than just the tape. He thinks that because he wasn't part of the entirety of the uh, voluntary workouts that maybe he's getting punished, but... I think it's a combination of a lot of things. Um, I don't blame the Lions at all. I think that you can make a case that there's players that are playing a lot better than Isaiah Bugs, who's playing well. That's what happens when you have uh, improved talent on the roster. What I don't agree with is why are you going to social media and none of us are going to go up to Isaiah Bugs because he's not that really like a player that a lot of media are not going to want to talk to. By you going out and playing mm-hmm. games on social media, scrubbing the Lions, it made everybody go up to him you on Monday. You don't make yourself a story. Yep, exactly. And, you know, and here's the thing. This is my big issue with it, right? So like, you now made yourself a story, and, and that's a thing. But the, 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 the roster hadn't even come out yet. Like nobody, know who, nobody knew who was going to be active or inactive for this game. So now you going out, you doing this, making yourself a story, scrubbing your, your, your Twitter and, and posting weird cryptic shit on Twitter, 
And now you have the, the, the media coming to you, asking you questions, and you guys have to delve into this. It now becomes a thing, and now it's a little bit of an advantage for, uh, for, for Kansas City. Like, they now know Isaiah Bugs isn't going to be there. So, like, they can kind of go through and make some adjustments if they need to. Now, look, I'm not saying that Isaiah Bugs is a game-changing player, but what I'm saying is he's a dude on this roster, and last year, especially towards the end of the year, he was a guy that every single one of you said that you wanted to come back, that you wanted them to go out and bring back because he was impactful. Go back, watch that Week 17 game against, uh, or that Week 18 game against Green Bay. That dude was making plays, especially in the red zone against Aaron Rodgers. So go watch that because all of you said the same exact thing. We want him back. And they got him back. And look, now he's not playing. And look, Dan Campbell has been very forthright with the media. Basically said, look, we've got guys who are showing better stuff on tape. So it seems like it's more of a, of a schematic thing where they're going to get better production from different guys. And that's the route they're going. And you know what? I love that. I love the fact that this team, this defense is so deep that they've got a guy who was a starter last year who's now been designated to second or third string. And in this case, he's not even active on the game day roster. So let that sink in. This is a dude who started for you last year. And this year, he's not even starting. He's not even going to be active for the game. So this team has come completely, completely uh, around and has basically transformed and flipped this defensive roster over the course of the last two years, which I think is awesome. And I think it helps bode well for this team going in and shocking the world, really kicking this Lions hype into overdrive. How do you see the 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 Lions doing this? How, how do you see the, this kind of shaking out? Because I'm not sure if you're on board with me where I do believe they're going to win. And I do want to get into some predictions after we kind of talk about this. But this team is working on shocking the world, being the biggest story in the NFL. Can they do it? Can they shock the world? Can they kick the Lions hype train into overdrive? I, I, w- w- what do you see happening here? Yeah, it's crazy, right? It's uh, Now you got news coming out with the Chiefs. I, I think that the, the Travis Kelsey thing that broke on Tuesday, I think that when you look at it, and uh, it's just, I would be shocked. I think maybe he'll get a day off. Uh, you know, maybe he, he, he'd take advantage of some time off before the game. But you look at the history, Travis Kelsey has not missed more than four games, I think, in like his in the last like five, six years. So I would be shocked to not see him if, if he gets ruled out. I would be shocked. But it could happen. You know, these knee injuries are, are crazy. But uh, I'm all for, and, and for those that say you want the Chiefs at full strength, no, no, I want them as depleted as possible. If Mahomes tweaks his ankle and goes out in the first play of the game, I'll be okay with it because I think the Chiefs on paper are a little bit better than the Lions. But I look at it and I say that the Lions can compete in this contest by being able to uh, take advantage of their run game, by having David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs be a big part of the offense. You got Amon Ross St. Brown that can move the chains. And when you need a safety valve, you got Jared Goff getting it to Sam Laporta. I think the game plan is to time a possession, baby, run the football and keep that clock moving. And the best offense, uh, the best way to defend against uh, Patrick Mahomes is to have a great offense and to have a performance of a lifetime where you get into a situation where you have like a a 30 minute to, you know, maybe a 35 minute to 25 minute advantage in the game clock by 10 minutes or so. If you can, if you can hold the football a little bit longer, now you have an opportunity to keep Patrick Mahomes away from you because the way I see it shaking out is obviously I'm pessimistic. I'm like, I think he's going to be toe to toe and Mahomes magic is going to come out. Lions will be up by four or maybe as much as six, seven. And Mahomes is just going to like, he, he could be playing like shit. The, the first three quarters, all of a sudden the fourth quarter comes, the bright lights are on and he's going to start zipping the ball over the place runs and just that elevated nature of what he can do on a football field. And he just takes over the game by himself, which wouldn't be terrible. I mean, he's one of the game's greats of all time, but I just don't want to see that because I was telling another reporter, that's what I want in Detroit. I want a, a, a player that can just elevate and transcend game plans where you're like, you throw the kitchen sink at Patrick Mahomes, and we're all sitting here scared still that he's going to light us up. I think it's going to be very close. I, I'm thinking this is going to be a nail-biter, butt-clencher for everybody in Detroit. Late at night, 11:25. Chiefs, uh, ho- hopefully Lions have the advantage. The, what, what I want to see, I want to see the Lions up by four with the Chiefs needing a touchdown and with like – Two minutes and 40 seconds left, and let's see, do the Lions uh, make the play? Do the de- Does the defense make the play? Because that's championship level. That's championship pedigree, and that'll go a long way 
for the Lions should they hold uh, Mahomes out of the end zone. It goes a long way for the Lions getting the W. It's going to be close, cuz. It's going to be close, very close contest. I just, it's hard to see the Lions winning because the numbers are so stacked against the Lions. I mean, dude, it's the craziest shit ever, right? Cuz the Chiefs don't lose in openers, especially at Arrowhead. Yeah, and, and I think more to your point, you've already seen it where Patrick Mahomes has basically had 35 seconds in the fourth quarter and can go ahead and win you a football game by throwing that touchdown. So I, I think the two minutes and 30 seconds, like you're saying, I don't even think that matters. Uh, I really do think if, if Detroit's going to win this game, it, it's going to be a lot of what you said, right? It's going to be a lot of limiting uh, Patrick Mahomes and the Kansas City Chiefs possessions. How do you do that? You, you run the ball, and you run the ball well. Uh, it's picking up those short yardage plays, uh, but it's being on time with first downs that really puts you in those positions. So I think offensively, if they're start on time, then they pick up the short yardage and they, they control the clock and they possess the ball, it's going to limit what Kansas city can do. Then defensively, you've got to make a couple of stops. You have to be able to, to stop Kansas city. And in the end, what I want is I want Detroit with the ball, with a three or four point lead uh, with roughly, I don't know, a minute 30 left and Kansas City has no timeouts. That's that's what I want to happen. Uh, I do think it's a bit of a, of a task for them, though, because like you said, Kansas City doesn't lose these games. These these opening games, I think Kansas City is like five and oh, Patrick Mahomes hasn't thrown an interception in any of these games like he is clinical. He he's He's like a surgeon on top of that. The thing that really does help the Detroit Lions going into this game is, like you said, you had the news coming out about Kelsey. Don't believe that uh, Jones is going to be available for this play for this game. So now you're missing two bro- two Pro Bowl players on both ends of the ball. Possibly, uh, at least Kelsey's not going to be 100. Uh, percent That being said, Kelsey at what 70, 80 percent still better than most tight ends in the league. But the guy's just an absolute savage. But you're going to take those advantages. You need to take those advantages going into this game. I think Detroit can't fall behind early. I think they have to score, whether it's field goals or whether it's touchdowns. They have to score when they have the chance to. You can't go three and out against this team because it'll just punish you. So, again, start on time, pick up short yardage, uh, hope your defense can hold up and make a couple of stops. And just put points on the board when you can, whether it's offensively or defensively. All that being said, I believe this team goes into Kansas City, and I think they get the W. I've been saying it for a couple of weeks now. And the reason for that is I've already mentioned that that they're going to be a little bit shorthanded. Uh, whether you've got guys who haven't wanted to sign their contract extension and are holding out, or whether you've got a guy like Kelsey who's dealing with a hyperextended knee. Uh, you You might have a couple of other guys banged up. Um, so I think roster wise kind of favors the Lions. Lions at this point are pretty healthy. We're not really hearing about any injuries. Uh, really and truly the only thing that's hurting them right now is Jamison Williams not being on the field because he's suspended. Uh, I do think him being on the field, it really forces a different look for Kansas city's defense. He has the ability to really stretch the field. And I think that helps open up a lot of stuff underneath, whether it be for Jameer Gibbs or whether it be for Amonra St. Brown. But all that being said, this team showed you last year that they're able to work those underneath passes. They're able to to work what is given to them and pick up the yards after the catch. So I'm not necessarily concerned there, but it would be a bonus to have JMO out there because you can run some different schemes. You can run some different fits. But I think you also have a bit of a Super Bowl hangover for Kansas City. Remember, this is the night that they're getting their rings. This is the night that they're raising their banner. There's going to be a whole procession. There's going to be a a whole bunch of pop and circumstance. It's a big deal. And yeah, this team has been there before. Yeah, this team has been able to win in those situations. But I think this is this is the 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 right moment for the Detroit Lions. They can go in. They can play loose. Kansas City might be playing tight, and I think that all bodes well for the Detroit Lions. I think they get off to a good start. I think they put some points on the board, and I think they end up leaving Kansas City with a three-point win. So I'm all aboard the hype train. I'm pumped up. I'm excited for this. What do you think Detroit? What do you think the Detroit Lions have to do offensively to put some points on Kansas City's defense? Because we've already talked about at this moment in time, points are going to be a premium. 
Uh, I think it was Jared Goff and it was Patrick Mahomes who had that crazy, I think it was like 49 to 47 game. It was the Rams versus Kansas City. And I don't know if that was a Thursday night game or if that was a Monday night game, but it was a prime time game and it was absolutely wild. What do you think the Detroit Lions have to do to put these points on the board to really make Kansas City feel it? Because I think that's what you're looking at here, right? You need your offense to go out and put points on the board, put Kansas City in in some pressure spots, and really kind of turn the tables on them. Usually Kansas City, it's a boat race. They can score a ton of points and outrace you. I think the Detroit Lions have to get in that mindset where they're looking to score a ton of points and, and, and trying to outrace the Kansas City Chiefs. How do you think they do that? Because, again, I already mentioned they're down JMO, who I think, again, gives you different looks and allows your offense to do different things. How do you think a guy like Amonra St. Brown and a guy like Jameer Gibbs and uh, uh, David Montgomery get utilized in this offense in this first game? Yeah, it's. Um, I look at it and I say, Ben Johnson, maybe a little bit of creativeness, maybe a little bit of trick plays, going for it on fourth down, being aggressive, you know, maybe a fake punt here or there. Take advantage of many as many opportunities as you can to keep the football. I, I really think you run your offense. I mean, as long as really the team ideally, we're talking idealistically here right this second, ideally the defense plays well and only gives up field goals, no big chunk plays, nothing crazy, and you you allow the offense to kind of handle it. As, as long as you don't get down too big, you're going to be in this game. I think you just run your offense. I think that you're going to hand the ball off quite a bit to David Montgomery. I think that Jared Goff's going to have quick releases to Amon Ross St. Brown screens. You're going to have Khalif Raymond. Maybe you take a couple deep shots off of run action predicated on the fact that you do get a little bit of success running the football. I think the keys are it starts up front with the offensive line and, and David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs. I think if, if you can really establish what everybody expects from that offensive line, you get four or five yards of run, you, you, you establish the line of scrimmage, you push back, the Chiefs defenders, and you make it a little bit easy for Jared Goff, I think you can expose a little bit of uh, of confusion and, uh, you know, mix signals there and have an opportunity to show one thing and, and take a chance here or there off of run action and see if you can maybe get behind the defense. I, I don't think you're going to try and throw it all that much deep because of what, you know, defenders like to do when you realize that you don't have that much of a deep threat. The the I think when you asked maybe the question, who's the wild card? I'm not sure how many snaps he's going to get early on and how much they're going to throw him in there. But if you want someone to try to take the top off the defense that's young and doesn't have a lot of tape, Antoine Green might be that guy at 6'2", 4'4", speed, showed what he could do a little bit with the block. You get him out there and, and you let him do some things and you get creative, you now have the opportunity to kind of, you know, put a little bit more pressure on the Chiefs' defensive line there as the Lions look to pound the rock. So you need a couple, I think, deep shots. But I just think you're absolutely right. Missing Jamison Williams stinks because you had a home run threat. But I do think that hitting a lot of singles is not a bad thing either. Like I said, mm-hmm. uh, Jameer Gibbs, David David Montgomery, it might be upon them to handle business so that Jared Goff can operate with St. Brown. I think that's the key is David Montgomery and can Jameer I, Gibbs got to get heavy targets and heavy productivity. Can I throw a name out there at you and you tell me if I'm crazy for thinking this way? I think Khalif Raymond plays an important role in this game. I think he's the one guy who is really undervalued in this offense. And look, Khalif Raymond's not he's not necessarily a Pro Bowl player. He's not a guy who you immediately think about. But I think he's a guy who is a utility weapon. He's a guy who, when they need a play, he usually comes up pretty clutch. And I'm not saying this guy's going to have a game where he's going to put 115 yards up and score two touchdowns. I'm, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is I think there's going to be a, a spot in this game. There's going to be a big moment. I think he comes up with a big reception or he comes up with a big play in this game, and it helps flip it a little bit. Momentum might be sliding on the lines. It might be going Kansas City's way. And I think he, Khalif Raymond, makes a play that really kind of turns everything and flips it back towards Detroit. Am I crazy for thinking that way? No, Khalif Raymond, man, he's reliable. I mean, he makes those deep – like, I, I think you're absolutely right dude, that when Goff needed a deep play last year, he'll take a shot to Khalif. I just think that the Chiefs could have it defended. But uh, I, I do think it's 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 an opportunity to really reward somebody that works hard and, and is somebody that's savvy, a savvy veteran. Yeah, Khalif Raymond could take the top off too, but, it, you know, you naturally expect the taller receivers like a Reynolds or an Antoine Green mm-hmm. to potentially – and, and you, you, you also – uh, use Khalif in a similar role to give St. Brown a spell too, kind of slot 
kind of intermediate stuff, yards after the catch kind of stuff. I don't know. Uh, we'll see if, if they can execute it. I just don't think that you want to take chances because it's such a – if the Chiefs' offense wasn't so lethal, you just fling it all over the place and, and, and go with it. Like maybe you could do that against the Seahawks because y- you maybe don't have as much confidence in Geno Smith as you do where if you mess up and give the, an extra possession or two, that might be it. That might be the the game right there, one possession – extra that you give Mahomes and that can be the ball game. So I think they're going to be, I think they're going to be conservative. I think when you're on the road, mm-hmm. maybe you, you are a little bit more aggressive and you just throw caution to the wind. I think the chiefs will dictate a, that a little bit by how they come out and what kind of game it's going to look like. But I, I'm thinking people are expecting an offensive shootout. I'm thinking the under, I think that this is going to be Ooh. a game like 21, 17, real tight back and forth. It's the first game might be a little rust in that first quarter, might have some three and outs, some mistakes, some you know procedural stuff while they get settled in, and I just think that it's it's going to be two defenses that match wits with each other and, and and handle business. So I'm curious, how do you see this playing out? And is there another under the radar player that you could see maybe on defense that could make a play? Because I think that one way the Lions can get offense, wouldn't it be great if we could just get immediate returns from Brian Branch? He just gets right there and is in the right spot, and the ball's thrown right to him, and he just runs right into the end zone. A cheap six points would be so huge, especially with the camp that he had. Uh, maybe a Cam Sutton makes a play, or hell, Detroit would love it. I mean, just for the ratings alone, just to see how the hell C.J. Gardner-Johnson would react if he picked mm-hmm. off Patrick Mahomes and got into the end zone. I think that uh, he, he would run the length of the field maybe twice with all the energy and trash talking that he's got going on. So we'll see if the defense can give the Lions offense some points. Is there anybody else under the radar that you think could be Besides Khalif Raymond, you think it's St. Brown? You just like the go-to guy where you say, look, stop St. Brown and good luck doing it because the man just gets open. You know, when you were talking, it, I, I had a thought and I wanted to run this by you. We, we Last year at the very end of the season when they were cleaning out their lockers, St. Brown had talked about wanting more deep routes. And you were talking about we, we brought up Khalif Raymond and, and him making a play and how he can stretch the field. Do you think there's a, a a point in this game where Amonra St. Brown kind of slides into that receiver role where he's the guy stretching the field, where he's the guy who can get downfield? This is a guy who can get a ton of separation. And look, he doesn't necessarily have crazy speed, but he's a pretty quick guy. Is he a guy? Do we see more plays? Do we see more routes in his route tree where he is now streaking down the field and he's trying to take the top off the defense and allowing some underneath stuff for a guy like a Jameer Gibbs or David Montgomery or even a Cleef Raymond, who you said they like to utilize in that slot role, just like Amonra St. Brown. Does he have a little bit of a of a of, of, of a more of a role in this offense? And do they maybe slide him out wide instead of just using him in that slot position? Oh, yeah. Amonra St. Brown wants the rock, baby. He could be showcased in a lot of different ways. I hope he could do it too, man. But you expose yourself to getting whopped by the safety. That's the risk you mm-hmm. have is that there's going to be safety help a lot of times probably if you choose to double him because he's obviously the best wide receiver. And if, if there's going to be some of that Tampa 2 type stuff or if there's going to be some coverage his way, you risk him taking that big hit if Goff, as you know, does hangs it up there. And if he's just one beat behind Amon Ross St. Brown, you're setting yourself up for the guy to take a big, massive hit, which I don't think you want. I think you want to keep it conservative and you want him to get it in space and to work his magic and to get him open through the scheme. So... I'm interested to see how many deep balls total they throw. I think it'll be under three, but it, mm-hmm. could, be, it could be impactful. We'll see. You know, I, I, you, when you're talking about under the radar defensive guy who's going to make a play, what about Jack Campbell? I think Jack Campbell is a guy who has a big game, has an impact on this game. I think he sets a tone early for this team. I think he does a good job uh, bottling up a guy like Pacheco. Uh, I think he does a, a good job taking care of some of the underneath stuff, you know, Kansas City likes to run a lot of misdirection plays, right, where they'll have you crossing across the middle. I think he does a good job of bottling some of that up. So my my under-the-radar guy who's going to have uh, have an impact in this game is going to be Jack Campbell. I think him at that linebacker position, I think he makes a couple of big plays, maybe forces a turnover, maybe forces a turnover. Maybe I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, maybe I'm eating the cornbread, but I think he forces uh, uh, some type of game-changing play on the defensive side, and you're right. If you can get a guy like Brian Branch, if you put uh, Mahomes under some pressure and you're able to kind of bottle him up and maybe he throws one up or maybe it's a tip ball and Brian Branch gets the ball and is able to walk it in for an easy six, how freaking awesome would that be? How great would that be? And I think that's what this team is going to need. Look, 
Kansas City, there's a reason they're the Super Bowl champs. There is a reason when you go and you look at power rankings, you look at uh, a lot of the stuff where, where it relates to breakdowns on players. There's a reason why Patrick Mahomes is the, one of the best, if not the best quarterback in the league. This offense is so potent. And the defense isn't too bad either. There is a reason why this team is a heavy favorite to win the Super Bowl next year or win the Super Bowl this year. So, yeah, they're going to need some of those cheap, easy points, and they're going to have to take advantage of them when they come their way. Yeah, it's. Um, I look at it and I say, it's going to be tough, man. I think Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid will see Jack Campbell out there and they'll try to test him and see what he's about. So you want to put him in positions to succeed, maybe on third down early on, and you don't want to like rush him into the scenario where he's got to you know, make plays right away. I think you're going to see a lot of Derek Barnes and Anceloni, and you'll have an opportunity maybe to see Campbell work alongside uh, Rodriguez in sub packages too. But uh, you want to? I would do it in, in situations where it's not like third and two. I would do it in third and you know uh, six or longer when you have some advantageous situations where you can blitz and take advantage of a strength. You don't want it to be where it's a free play and and Campbell's got to kind of have that situation where he's got to kind of determine is it a pass out of the backfield or a, a play where Mahomes has fifty million options to to operate. So we'll see. I, I do think he's going to have an impact. But I do think there's going to be some mistakes too because that position, cause it's it's a nightmare to play. You got to know your keys. You got to know exactly. And then, I mean, these offenses are so intricate. They make one move this way. They fake motion this way to to, to scheme open a receiver going the other way. Crossing routes, tight ends. I mean, if if Kelsey suits up and plays, it's going to be a nightmare for for any opponent, let alone a rookie trying to handle everything. But I think he's excited. I think he's going to handle it. I think you're going to see hopefully his impact and his ability to recognize run plays and blowing up a play here or there when needed. But it's a tough position, man. And rookie linebackers in the NFL, who sometimes opposing offenses can take advantage. So I think he'll do okay. He'll hold it. He'll he'll have a mixed bag. Great plays where you see the promise, but also situations where Patrick Mahomes is gonna do his thing and look his look one way and fake the other. And and even a, a situation where he'll be looking right at Jack Campbell directly in the face and throw the ball far to the left and it'll look amazing or across his body or sidearm or improvising. So we'll see. We'll see how it all plays out. I'm very fascinated to see how this all shakes out. It's going to be a um, a real fun game. So give me your prediction, Cuz. What, you, what are you seeing? What do you think? I think this game goes, goes the Lions away and I think it's a 34, 34-31 game Detroit yeah. Lions. I think you're going to have to rely on Patterson to make some kicks. So as much as everybody wants to bag on Patterson, he's going to have to come up pretty clutch in this game. Um, you're going to need him, and you're going to need oh, his God. leg, and he's going to have to be accurate. All right, how are you feeling? How are you feeling about Patterson, man? I was I was trying to think of a question Tuesday to ask in regards to, like, it's kind of hard to determine because you know they're going to say, like, how much do you know his range so that it determines, like, how aggressive the Lions are going to be. I think they're going to be aggressive, but I'm 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 nervous if he's lining up for a fifty yard uh, fifty yard kick to win the game. Yeah, I, I think for him, anything forty five and in, I think they're comfortable with. Um, you know, when you start getting to the back half of the forties and you get into the fifties, that's when he seems to struggle. He hasn't, for some reason, been able to develop that power in his leg. I am I'm comfortable and I'm confident with him. I think at this point, it might just be a little bit of a mental thing with him. I think he has the ability to kick a 50-yard field goal, and I think this team can count on him to do that. I just think he's got to believe it, and I think his coach has to believe it. I think Dan Campbell doesn't necessarily believe in him right now. That's why there was all this talk about them possibly looking for a new kicker. I think he's going to be pretty good, and I trust him to do his job. But that being said, Dan Campbell loves going for it on fourth and one or depending on what the analytics say with them in fourth down. So I do believe they're going to be aggressive on fourth down. I do see them going for it. And I do see them taking some risks because I do believe in this game, Dan Campbell's mindset is basically going to be, we got to let it hang out. We kind of got to go balls to the wall. We got to do what has gotten us here. You go back and you look at what this team did over the course of the last 10 games last year. Basically, right around Thanksgiving, from Thanksgiving on, this team was a, was a machine. Even that Thanksgiving Day game, I think we all believe the Detroit Lions should have beat the Buffalo Bills. Well, at least I do anyways. That team just kind of let it all hang out. They went balls to the wall every play. It's going to be that mentality. It's going to be those types of game plans, and it's going to be those types of situations where Dan Campbell's not afraid to go for it that's going to help turn the tide and help this team win this game. 
Yeah, I can't wait. I think it's going to be close. I, I just see Mahomes' magic, man. I, I'm, I'm more skeptical. I think it's going to be. Don't spe- be shook, bro. Don't be shook. Come on. No, no. I, I, I think it's going to be. I think it's Mahomes, baby. I, I always look at football, and when you keep it in a simple, uh, keep it simple, stupid model. Who's got the best player on the field? And it's the Chiefs. It's Mahomes. So until the Lions show that they can do stuff on defense, it's an offensive league. I expect them to touch. Uh, Kadarius Tony and the flag to go down. I mean, I'm expecting all the the chicanery and the fuckery to go down. Uh, I expect that uh, Lions will make an interception and a flag will go down. I expect it to be a pro Chiefs referee. I expect them to fuck the Lions in every which way possible. And I I, I see Jerry Jacobs putting his hand on a receiver, a hand on Kelsey, blowing on him a little bit, flag. So I look at it and I say, until the Lions get the respect and punch an opponent in the mouth and win on that stage— it's the champ until, you know, the age-old adage, you've heard it before, to be the man, you got to beat the man. Until I see it, the Chiefs are the man, and they own the belt, and they get the champion's advantage. And you can get some uh, some jabs in there, but in the end, uh, let's make sure that uh, if you have the opportunity to win it, they got to play a, a, a Super Bowl caliber game, and I'm not so sure week one the Lions are going to do that. So we'll see. I, I predict it to be a loss. But I don't think it's, it's in the grand scheme of things. I don't think it's going to be a bad loss. I think it'll be a, a professional performance, but a situation in which the excellence of execution from the Chiefs might be just enough to win the game. Do you think we see something like we've seen in the Seattle game a few years ago where the ball got swatted out of the end zone and there was a, a, a misunderstood rule that cost the Lions or even going back forever ago where Calvin Johnson caught the ball in Chicago – put the ball down on the ground and they said it was incomplete when it was really a touchdown or we have some kind of pass back and forth kind of thing. Even though that was a coaching issue, but there was a, a, a flag that was thrown prior to that, that gave Aaron Rodgers that last chance to throw that touchdown. Do we see something like that in this game where we're like Detroit lions are still disrespected, even though they got this opportunity, even though they got put on this stage, this game came down to a moment where the referees still don't respect the Detroit Lions and cost them. Do we have a situation like that? Man, <laughs> I couldn't handle that. I don't want that at all. No, I think uh, no, I think clean coaching, clean situations. I just yeah. think the officials will play a part in, in the number of flags they throw. Okay, all right, I respect that, and I, I could totally see that being being the case as well. Um, I hope we don't have. Any any disrespect from the refs, I mean, you really boil it down. That's really what it is, right? You can call it a misunderstanding of the rules, or you could just say the rules were unclear as much as you want. It really comes down to disrespect. The Lions have been so disrespected by the league for so many years that those types of penalties and those types of situations ended up creating new rules. And you can go through the rule book and be like, how many rules did the Detroit Lions have a direct impact on? And there's a ton of them. I don't think we get that. I think this is a new breed of your Detroit Lions. I think they command respect. I think they get that respect. I do think there might be a couple of flags that are thrown and a couple of flags that were like, what? Are we serious right now? But I think this is, for the most part, a clean coach game, and I think it's a good game. I'm still riding with the Lions. Lions win it. You got the the Kansas City Chiefs winning it. Should be an interesting game. I know we are excited for it. You're going to be in Kansas City. I want to talk about that real quick. How pumped up are you? So this will be your first. This will be your first road trip as a member of the media, going to a different stadium, right? This is your first time traveling out of. You've done. You basically handle everything that comes to Detroit. You take care of all of that. But this will be your first time going on the road to cover the Detroit Lions. Yeah, um, of course. Uh, I, I I didn't get a chance to send it to you. It was crazy. What did you hear on Tuesday? All of United's airlines have been grounded due to a computer issue. We have diarrhea bringing down planes. So <laughs> in the, you know, <laughs> I'm like, fuck that. And, and it's more cost effective. I'm driving. I got a Nissan Rogue and I'm hitting the road, baby. And we're getting out early. I'm a morning guy. 12 hour drive. No big deal. And, and the blessing is Kansas City's an hour behind. So I gain an hour going there. So I'm driving, listening to the radio, uh, listening to music the whole way. I'm going to drive it, enjoy it, love it. Um, it's the, probably the only trip I'll take, maybe outside of the playoffs this year. You got to do it if you cover the NFL. You got to kind of be there away a little bit, uh, make a trip. So I'm going to do it. 
and I'm going to have the opportunity, hopefully, to see a good game. And I'm excited for it. I think that I'm ready for it. Uh, obviously, the locker room's comfortable with me. They like to talk to me. Oh, I, I mean, I, I can count on one hand how many denials I've gotten. Now, they do give a lot of cliche answers, and I'm certain they've been told, hey, watch what you say in front of that guy because he'll print anything. That motherfucker will write anything. <laughs> but they do talk to me. They are friendly. They do reveal a little bit of nuggets here and there. Um, so I'm ready to go on the road because you get a little more access and it's Arrowhead. It's like, like you said, it's like the, one of the stops to make it's the, it's the, it's one of the biggest stadiums that is out there in regards to positivity, good, good crowd, good football people, good barbecue. And I just, I think it's the fairest assessment that I can get for how this Lions team stacks up with the man. And that's the reason why I think it's great. Um, to be able to have the opportunity. They let me do it on the road with all the extra media attention that's going to be there. I think it's a great opportunity, and you got to do it once to get out there and come back Friday. And uh, I got to, you know, a great opportunity to do it. And thanks to everyone, the listeners at the podcast and everybody that made it happen. So I'm excited for it. And uh, it's going to make for a long day on Thursday. But, you know, those 8.30 games are tough. But the way we'll do it is give a little insight. We'll just do a game recap um, maybe a reaction story based on what happens and then um, grades and that'll be it. And then the heavy coverage comes Friday morning where it's just all out. And basically every hour there'll be content about uh, snap counts, who performed well, what the national media was saying. All the coverage will hit Friday morning and, and it's all set in place. It's pretty much automatic, you know, unless there's some crazy news that happens that will veer the coverage. It's good because football lends itself to kind of planning in a good way. So, Makes for a long night Thursday, but everybody that, that listens uh, to our podcast next week will get the inside scoop on what it was like, and everybody at All Lions will get the opportunity to read what that's going to be about. And I'm hoping it's a good trip. Like, like I said, I'm not that much of a traveler. I've been to Florida a couple times, been to uh, uh, South Carolina, which I really enjoy, been to California when I was younger, but yeah, last five, six years, been to Mexico, last five, six years, not into flying, so it's much cheaper to drive. And I'm avoiding any headaches. Hopefully there's no big traffic jam, but I got a day and a half to get there. So if there's an issue, we'll figure it out. So I can't, I can't wait for it. It's going to be a fun time to get out on the road and see what's going on. You know what I mean? Yeah. I hope you have a fantastic time. Should be a good time. I'll be excited to hear all about your, your travel experience when you get back. And we'll break some of that down on uh, next week's show when, uh, when we go to record. Now, we did have some college football that did take place this past weekend. I do want to touch on some of that. I, I want to know what you took out of this MSU Central Michigan game. I, I think we both have to be careful when we watch week one. Neither one of our teams really played anybody. Um, I took in both games. I'm assuming you took in both games or as much of both games as you could. I, I thought Michigan State started incredibly slow. But I think once they got a little bit comfortable, I, I think this offense is going to be better than it was last year. I don't know how much better, though. I think offensively, it was rough if you watched the first half, maybe the first uh, half and, and half of the third quarter. But I think once that offense kind of settled in, there were some adjustments that were made. You can see that there there's some talent here. Noah Kim, I don't think, is going to be the quarterback that I was expecting him to be or hoping him to be. Um, he, he really does feel like he is a game manager who has the ability to throw it deep, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, I feel like there were a lot of missed opportunities offensively, especially early in that game uh, with wide receivers dropping balls. And sometimes the run game just looked stagnated and you're going up against a, a, a vaunted central Michigan team. And I say vaunted sarcastically, uh, but I do think that offense will be better. What, what was your take out of the MSU central Michigan game? Man, it was a slow start. It was horrible. It was just not any situation in which it was enjoyable in that first half. It was like a throwback to garbage football. It just wasn't fun. You know what I mean? You look at that kind of contest, and I think I tweeted out at Detroit Podcast, I said, in the age of football, it's like a 10-7 game at halftime. I'm like, what the hell is this? It wasn't entertaining. It sucked, and I wanted it to be over by halftime, to be quite frank. You know, you're playing central. And Central had a quarterback who could not, cause he could, Emmanuel Jr. could not throw the football. He couldn't throw the ball to save his life. Literally, and, and that was talked about beforehand. So you didn't, you didn't capitalize. And for me, 
And you could talk me off the ledge because I was bummed out because what happened was, obviously, you look at the matchup of the week and you look at Florida State LSU, and what do I see? Keon Coleman getting (laughs) the attention that a star number one wide receiver would deserve. And what do I see online, which is the epic trolling of Michigan fans and very smart, sarcastic people who think like me, who post, man, Michigan State had Jaden Reed and Keon Coleman, and that equated to five wins? What the fuck are y'all doing over there? Yeah, yeah, I, I had to eat some of that all weekend long. And and after watching that game so Sunday, I was pissed. Because then it makes it just juxtaposes that where I go, and, and then you have people who make excuses. And to, to set the table, I'm not an excuse maker. Because someone says to you, well, you're a podcast, you can't cover media. Bullshit. I, that's not the case. A podcaster can, can cover media. A podcaster can take a non-traditional form and make it a traditional form. So those that say... Keon Coleman was never going to stay at Michigan State. Yeah, no shit when his quarterback can't get him the ball and you make him the second or third option and you don't get him the rock. He does not feel in the love. And that's Mel Tucker's job. So I don't want to hear those excuses. I'll, I'll share that opinion and, and share it with the world if you send that to me. But that's not how I view things. Mel Tucker's job is to sit with Keon Coleman day and night, day and night and say, what do you need? Two million, three million? Got it. You know, it's not to just be like, well... We, we, we developed him and we scouted him and we sent him off to prosper down south. Fuck that. If you, don't, if you don't procure talent and keep that talent, then that's on you. That's a huge knock on Mel Tucker. I don't care if he came and told Mel Tucker from day one, train me, I'm out. You figure out a way to keep him and you figure out every which way. You say, tell me who you want to throw to you and we'll go get that guy. He needs $5 million? Fine. That's how you build a program is to say, what do you need? Keons is a star. Clearly, a big receiver that can catch the ball and any guy that can score three touchdowns in a game. I mean, (laughs) it was great to see our guy get the one-handed touchdown, but it doesn't look like in any capacity you got any superstars. Maybe the running game for State was impressive. Maybe that can go forward, but it just just bothered me that Keon Coleman balled out for another team and you had talent, you won five games. It puts the the onus square one on Mel Target. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, your job is to recruit talent. And and if you're going to, like, this is not, Michigan State is not central. And unfortunately, what I was left feeling is that Michigan State is central in, in, in relation to what they are in the Big Ten. And that leaves you feeling dejected because we're high achievers here at the podcast. We aim for the stars, and we sometimes even get into the atmosphere. We don't, we don't, uh, make excuses and and to see Michigan state not be at the top level. And then, you know, basically then you see, you know, you see Michigan go out and destroy their opponent. And you got JJ who everybody said, Oh, someone maybe here on the network said he doesn't even have to throw the football, but he did throw the football and he looked damn good doing it. So we'll see if, if it turns around and Michigan state grows, but I just was left deflated thinking, man, you're not, you're not, you're not big time. You're just playing for, you're playing for seven wins. And, and, and that, that's just a bummer for me. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it's weird because we talked about this last week with MSU where if they win eight games, you probably hit above your belt. Right. And when you watch them take on central and it is a sluggish game, especially, like I said, the, the, the first half first, I don't know, Hours of that game, it was hard to watch. It was a struggle, and there wasn't a ton to really feel great about. And you're going up against a quarterback who, like you said, can't really throw it. So what's going on here? Like, wh- why aren't we blitzing more? Why aren't we doing some different exotic packages? And look, I get it. It's week one. You don't want to throw a whole bunch of stuff out there because you don't want people to to know what you're doing. But you really would have liked to see some type of a big play early in this game to really help set the tone and maybe get the fans involved, get the fan base charged up, get everything going and get a little bit of momentum. And it just really didn't. It was a a painful game to watch. Now, conversely, I'm not sure how much of the U of M game you took in, but I watched this game and I was surprised uh, with a couple of things. And they're both on the offensive side of the ball. I thought defensively they did a good job, but you're going up against ECU, so take it for what it's worth. Offensively, I was surprised at how much trouble the run game had to get going. I was shocked that this is what this team is built on and predicated on, and that offensive line looked like they were struggling to move guys. All that being said, 
what they lacked in a run offense, they made up in a pass offense. The offensive line did a great job of providing protection uh, for, for J.J. And I thought the ability of the coaching staff and the offense to basically go from what they wanted to do in running the ball to then flipping the script and going and passing the ball, and it seemed seamless. This is this is the most fluid I think this offense has looked for ever in a day. This team has been built on just cramming the ball down your throat, and it's it's basically put your hard hat on and we're running through a wall. It is it is a hammer and a nail type of mentality all day long. This offense showed a little bit of smoothness, showed the ability to pivot. Uh, showed a willingness to do something different, to do something that they're normally uncomfortable with doing, and that is passing the ball. That is stretching the field. That is allowing your quarterback to move. JJ looked very good when he was rolling out and when plays broke down and he had to and he had to adjust on the fly. He looked very comfortable, very calm, and made some made some very good plays. Scored a couple of touchdowns. I'm not saying he set the world on fire, but what I'm telling you is the offense and the mindset of this offense to go from what they normally like to do and it not being there and working, being able to pivot and allow JJ to open up the playbook and be confident in his ability to open up that playbook and understand what needs to be done and letting him throw the ball makes me feel a lot better as a Michigan fan. And that was the big thing I took out of that game. Did you watch any of the U of M game? Was there anything that you took away from it? Man, I just was like, I was, I was impressed a little bit with the aggressiveness. I thought that, uh, you know, I looked at it and I said, man, who was a leader offensively? Roman Wilson. Hmm, I like that. But uh, I think the thing that, obviously, being that I'm a state supporter, is I look at things critically more with Michigan. I thought that Donovan Edwards maybe could have brought a little more to the table. And I think that his development, if you're going to hope that Michigan wins it all, you need a little bit more from him. But other than that, I thought that the team played at a very high level without Jim Harbaugh. Yeah, I thought they did as well. Um, I, I find what they're trying to do with their coaching staff to be very weird. Uh, where next or this week you're going to have two coaches uh, basically coaching a half each, and then you'll have Sharon Moore come back and coach game three. Uh, I, I find that to be weird, but I think it's I think it's a nice thing to try to do with your coaching staff. Give them a little bit of run, give them a little bit of rope, and let them get their feet wet. Like let them kind of try some stuff and kind of see where they're at. Uh, it's always good if you're a head coach to give your assistants that leeway, that ability to go out and coach a football game or to be able to be the man because that's what all these guys want. All these guys who are behind you, they want to basically do what you're doing. That is the end That is the end goal. And a lot of times what happens, and this honestly, this might be what is going on in at MSU. You have a coach who is – He's comfortable in his position, but he might be uncomfortable hiring those assistants who might be as good or better than him just because he's not really sure about his position. And you can see with Jim Harbaugh, Jim Harbaugh basically runs the damn university, and it's part of the problems that we've talked about for a couple of weeks now with the suspension and with different things going on. Mel Tucker signed that big deal, and that's a lot of pressure to work under. He might be a little bit nervous having that big deal, having that awesome season that he came off of and then not being able to duplicate that and then hiring assistant coaches who he might be afraid could take his job. That could be a thing. I just just putting it out there. I've got no inside information. I'm just speculating here. It's just it's it's refreshing to see a head coach give his other coaches, multiple coaches, the opportunity to get involved to take the reins and coach different games. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. So is there anything at all that caught your attention that Michigan needs to improve? Offensive line. I was, like I said, I was not impressed with, with the run fits. Uh, I I thought they could have did a better job uh, run blocking for the running backs. The, The running back position, which is what this offense has been built upon, just looked stagnated. It looked it looked rough. There were a couple of big plays that they had, but overall, I felt like going into that game, both of your running backs, Donovan Edwards and Blake Corum, should have both had a hundred plus yards and should have both had a touchdown or two. And you didn't really get that. Uh, Donovan Edwards looked like he had his feet in cinder blocks. He, he go look at his stat line. It, it was pretty rough. So I, I think. Fixing the run game is the one thing that I would like to see. Um, otherwise, like I said, 
defensively, I don't know what you're going to kind of take out of that game. Uh, I, I don't think that offense is something where you can really kind of hone in and be like, oh, yeah, this is what we got to work on. Um, ECU's defensive line, though, that is where their bread is buttered. I expected Michigan to perform better against that unit. And maybe they don't see a defensive line like that for the rest of the year. But that being said, I was hoping that Michigan's offensive line would be able to overpower uh, Eastern Carolina's uh, defensive line and just was not was not the case. So it's it's that offensive line in the run game. Got it, man. It's going to be great. I mean, the only thing we can talk about really moving forward is a lot of people kind of are, it feels like to me, are kind of poo-pooing the schedule and saying, look, I know it sucks that they're playing cupcakes, but if this is the, it, it kind of has been the mantra now that I'm kind of hearing from Michigan fans is, look, it sucks, yeah, but if it ends up allowing Michigan to kind of ease their way into the college football playoff in this new system. They're like, Alabama's done it. Georgia's done it for years. So why not do it? It just sucks. It just college football sucks because the average, it just sucks because the first week and week zero and week one, the average margin of victory was three touchdowns plus. So there wasn't a lot of intrigue and it just sucks that at this point in time that it, there weren't that many competitive good games the first part of the week. It just kind of took the fun out of it, and the games are still too long, and there's way too many commercials on television. So I don't care about the games being on Peacock. I subscribe to it all. I don't worry about any of that nonsense. If, if, if you're a fan of sports and you don't want to stream anymore, that's a you problem because that's the way it's going, and you you, you can't focus on shit you can't control. That's the way it's going. That's the way it's going to be. Pony up the, the, the 80 bucks a year for five things and figure out a way to spend $400 on streaming if you're a sports fan. For me, the big thing is is the games aren't competitive, which aren't it doesn't make it fun to sit through a three and a half hour game when the average margin of victory is twenty one points. Yeah, no, I get that, and it's it, it's it, early in the season. It is it is tough to watch some of these games. That's why I said there's not a whole lot you and I can really break down from both of these games and 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 really come to the table with because who the hell are you playing, right? Like U of M is playing an FBS school and. MSU is playing Central. And look, no disrespect to Central. Uh, I watched that game and I was screaming fire up chips, but they don't even have a quarterback who can throw. I think he's got feet for hands because that's what it looks like he was trying to do out there. So there's not a whole ton you can get out of it. I, I think what has to happen is obviously we're going towards super conferences. Uh, the ACC, I think, is the first team to get to to 18. MS, or maybe the Big Ten was first 18. Either way, AC, a, ACC is going to 18. Uh, Big Ten, obviously, bringing in Oregon, uh, bringing in Washington, USC, UCLA. So you're, you're, you're seeing the conferences explode. I think at a certain point, you need to you need to do away with or you need to only have one non-conference game and the rest of it all has to be in conference. If if Michigan was, I don't know, playing Minnesota or if MSU was – playing Iowa. I think these would be much more compelling games. I think they'd be much more interesting to watch. And I think we could gleam a little bit more and we would take that. And there'd be something for us to kind of break down. Instead, you're getting sisters of the poor against the big boys and it is what it is. Yeah. It's an interesting time that Michigan can win even without without <laughs> even without their coach. That's mm-hmm. kind of how poo pooed it is, is that hey, uh we don't even need Sharon Moore. You don't need to be there. Jim Harbour don't need to be there. We can do whatever the hell we want. And you're just like, okay. And that's how it went. So I look at it and I say that there's an opportunity for the uh, for the Michigan Wolverines to continue to grow. And they're on the right path. It's, it's fun for, for Wolverines fans this year. But I just feel like for me, the interest level will peak when the Big Ten season starts a little bit more. And the big contest against Ohio State and Michigan State on the Michigan slate. And then for Michigan, uh, for the Spartans, let's see how they do against Washington, how they compete. And how, how, I mean, Noah Kim looked rough cause he looked rough at first. Yeah. And you're just like, is it really that hard to find a quarterback that can shine? Is it really that hard? And then the big story will give like maybe three minutes to five minutes. And you got the, the, the meme of the week I thought was not in regards to Keon Coleman. The meme of the week was, some clown that put a picture of Mel Tucker and said, what a big upgrade going from Mel Tucker to Deion Sanders. And I was just like, oh, that's so good. Mm -hmm. So good. (laughs) This is what Twitter's for. And it just sucks because you got a guy that's like, 80 new players? Sure. 
Nepotism? Have my kids start? Sure. <laughs> sure. Everything, no problem. And then I get to sit there and make fun of the media and ask the media to root for me and to act a fool. And, and I don't know what, what it is for me, but there's something about a coach that just does a speech and then is like, hit my theme music. And, 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 and he just has a swagger and he backs it up. And I'm just like, Mel Tucker had the swagger, but then he lost the swagger. And that's even worse, I think, is that it, it, it kind of feels like you got the one player that carried you in Kenneth Walker, but you couldn't sustain that and keep it like the running back pipeline going and pair it up with a quarterback. Like you got, you got to kind of like you're making nine and a half million. You got to do some things here. And I'm hoping that, you know, the momentum changed because the negativity with Michigan State was at an all time, all time high. And, you know, Michigan fans are, are, are all are, are willing to pile on. So I just thought that Neon Dion stole the weekend and it was crazy to see. What would you make of that whole craziness with, De- with Deion Sanders? I think you have a, a very polarizing head coach who has the ability to connect with young players. And I think you've seen that, right? Going into this game, everybody was talking about how basically Colorado was going to fall flat on their face. They looked outstanding. It was a fun game to watch. And then if you, you hear any of the, the interviews that, that Dion did after the game, he's incredibly interesting and captivating. And like we knew this from his professional career, but him as a coach, it's impressive. It, it's impressive what his kid's been able to do. Uh, it's impressive watching him coach his kid. And then it's impressive watching him coach other guys. And essentially what he did was he walked into Colorado and he said, look, I'm burning this bitch to the ground and it's going to be nothing but ash when I'm done. So if you're still here, cool. You need to be a dog and you need to be down because what we're about to do, you haven't ever witnessed or experienced anything like this before. And my man went in there and and he's done it. And look, it's only one week. Uh, TCU was, was the, the, the national championship runner up last year. So obviously a good team. They have lost a lot of pieces, uh, so I don't think that that they're ranking. Uh, well, I think where were they ranked? I don't know if it was seven or seventeen. I don't remember. But either way, I think it was a little bit inflated, uh, especially with all the pieces that they had lost. Um, but to be able to go in and do that, and then do it with, like you said, a swagger, uh, a a a a way about you, it's impressive. And the guy's impressive, and it's obvious he knows how to coach. He knows how to connect with young players. He's got it rocking and rolling. It'll be interesting to see if he can sustain it, and it'll be interesting to see how the season works out for them. But I think it's it's fascinating to watch. From an outsider looking in, it's completely fascinating. Yeah, it was. And I like it. I like the swagger. I like the I just don't like the fact that he's asking media members to root for him. Do you believe? It's not the media's job to believe. The media's job is to report. And That's then you right. got the TV person's like, I always believe. The TV lady's like, I believe, oh, Dion, I believe. I believe, Dion Prime. Answer my question. <laughs> the TV just, people are horrible. Too. It was that's rough. But uh, I would, I actually thought about that. I'm like, okay, you know, I would have been like, no, your job's to prove me wrong every week. You know, it's only one week, man. You know what I mean? You don't win a title after one week, Dion. You know that. So these guys got to stand up for themselves. So we'll see how, how it goes forward because Neon Dion's taking it to a a whole other level with what he's trying to accomplish um, over there. So we'll see, but it made for a fun week. We'll see if the games get more competitive. Um, over the next, because for, for me, I'm an NFL guy, hands down. I have loyalties to college football in regards to local ties, but overall, NFL football is way more compelling at the highest levels. But um, you look at it, and college football gets good, but it gets good in late December and, and January. You know, that kind of stinks for everybody else involved because everybody's trying to maneuver. Hopefully the expansion to 12, ga- uh, to 12 teams will allow teams to kind of schedule a little bit tougher so that... They, because look, it was great. I thought LSU and Florida State was was great and competitive back and forth until the uh, until Florida State went ahead and and, and exposed um, Brian Kelly again for being a coach that still needs to do a lot more. So we'll see. But cuz here Does he we are. Does he not seem like he's the most fraudulent coach? Oh yeah. Like, oh he, yeah. It's like, crazy, man. He's it's, done good things, but man, he always seems to kind of shit the bed and then roll around in it. Yeah. It's weird. You know what's crazy? All us uh, content creators are all the same. Uh, game was on. And it's it's uh, Florida State starting to pull away. So you know what I had on my phone? I had the video. I had it saved with him and, and the guy dancing. And I'm like, this is stupid. This is old. And uh, 40 seconds later, Barstool posted it. <laughs> we all think the same. We're all trolls. We all think the same. Uh, that stupid-ass video of Brian Kelly dancing with the recruit is so memorable. 
that when he's getting his ass beat, all the content creators wanted to post it. I, I almost I almost fired the tweet. I almost did it, but I said, this is stupid. I'm a Detroit account. I don't want to be this way. It's unrelated, and I'm just being petty. But uh, literally 40 seconds later, I saw it hit my feed with Barstool, and I'm like, oh, you know what? I still got it. I got the creativity. I got the mm-hmm. youthful trolling mind still, but not uh, not for Brian Kelly. Not worth it. I save it for Detroit teams, and that's how we roll here. Cuz, congratulations, man. We got to 10 years. This is the 10th anniversary. We are now on the other side of 10 years. We've been bullshitting, talking, and like I said, the onus of the project was simple. Adam and I would talk sports at a bar and cost us now probably 80 bucks a pop every week to sit and talk junk. Now we get to do it uh, in a great way and allowed us to enjoy Detroit sports and be part of the community on a grand scale. Great things ahead, as always, for the podcast as we continue to grow do more things, have more fun. So congrats, cause 10 years of broadcasting. And it's evident now because we're in the episodes in the 520s. Go see another podcast locally that that is sequentially. And now you see others now doing video podcasts every single day. You see everybody doing it. And to be on the other side of 10 years is crazy. It's absolutely nuts, man. 10 years. Congratulations to you. Congratulations to me. Never in a million years would have thought two dudes sitting at a kitchen table, eating dinner, going down into a basement to talk sports on two microphones that sounded like tuna cans on a computer that froze up regularly would now be here. It's pretty awesome. Yes. Congrats, man. And, and 10 years later, you still got a 10 year old computer. You still got a 10 year old Toshiba. Maybe now <laughs> we'll figure out a way through the podcast to fire up your engine and get you caught up with a 2023 computer so that we can be talking and not have it just, turn off for no reason you got the virus baby because i know you're looking at all the dylan dennis tweets and all the all the inappropriate photos from daily loud and all that shit we know what you're looking at so maybe we'll fire you up with a brand new computer as an anniversary gift (laughs) i appreciate it thank you i I need a new one we've talked about it we talked about it last week i definitely need a new one so (laughs) we'll get it figured out here soon yes make sure you follow adam on twitter at adam r s t r o z follow the network at detroit podcast Always appreciate firing up the microphones. It's great. And I hope everybody, as you're listening, will be reporting from Arrowhead, all the craziness that's happening. And we'll bring you, I'll bring you all of the inside scoop of what the hell it was like to be at one of the premier NFL football stadiums, the environment, hopefully talking about a Detroit Lions victory on their way to maybe some great things in 2023. Everybody, thank you so much. Podcasting time is now over. Let's talk next week on the latest edition of Doc and Jack.